Well, that was, that was very lovely of you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Hi, welcome. As, as Rachel said, I'm Nigel, and I'm part of the team here at Wooded. It's really great to see you. In fact, my mum often commends me to the Lord. I don't know what that means, but she's very serious about it. I'm commending you to the Lord. I haven't got a promotion, I don't think, to be honest, so I'm but she does, and I appreciate it. So, well, good morning. What we love to do here at our church is when we gather together like this, and lots of times we get the Bible and we read from it, and we allow it to speak to us. So um, that's what we're doing this morning. And as Rachel said, we're, we're at the start of this season. I don't know if you find September, it's all kind of guns blazing where everything starts up and everything goes crazy all at the same time. But we're definitely like that in my family. We're starting school for the first time with some of my boys and oh my goodness. And so we all get very excited about everything and it's the time to get going. But we felt it's really important as a church, what are the core things, what are the key things that we must remind ourselves about and renew to us why they're important. So last week, Dave was um, speaking about worship, that our church is a worship centre. And what does that mean for us as we come along to Woodlands, if we're regular members? But also, what does that mean for the city? What does that mean for people who wouldn't necessarily say they were following Jesus or interested in that? I'd really encourage you, if you didn't listen to it, do go to our website and have a listen because it was a great talk around the heart of worship and what it means for us to be a worshiping community. So uh, yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about community and hearing some words that Jesus said to his disciples, that as we read about them, what does that say to us today around what does it mean to be followers of Jesus, but more than that, Jesus' community, and how do we do that? So I'm aware maybe for people here today that being in church might be unfamiliar to you, or that you're, you wouldn't say you're a paid up member of the Christian club or anything like that, then firstly, thank you for being with us. And I hope you can enjoy this talk as we just look at what it means to be community. And I, I believe actually when God has plans for community, community and for people it's not exclusively for religious types actually his heart is for every person to thrive and to do life and 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 to, to do well and so maybe as we listen to these things there'll be some things that resonate and from the words of Jesus as what does that mean to do community and I think it's easy to see in our day and age a society that I would say is increasingly individualistic the need for community the need for authentic community is still I believe a fundamental need for people to be known to be noticed and to belong and our hope is that as we look at this topic as a church that's something that we we live out really well that actually it's great for people to belong but to be welcomed into our community as well so in a moment I'll show you the verses in John 13 uh, verse 34 to 35 just a short little reading but uh, John is one of the Gospels that talks about the life of Jesus and this part of the Gospel of John is right at the end of Jesus's life in fact he's just about to get killed on the cross and so he's having dinner with his disciples disciples are the people who are following Jesus closely they're the keenies they're the people that he's invited to come and do life with him. And they've had a meal together. And Jesus has done something very profound and not something that would never happen is that he took a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. Normally that, that would be done by a servant. It was a, dis, it was a dirty job. And so they were a bit offended, in fact, some of them, that Jesus, this great teacher and rabbi that they've been following, would do such a lowly task. But he says to them, do you understand what I've just done for you? I've come to serve, and as I've served you, you must serve others. And so in the flow of that conversation, this is what he now says to the disciples. So they're all listening, a new command I give to you. Oh great, what's that? I love new stuff. Love one another. Oh, is that it? Yeah, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Well, is that it? It's very, very simple. Love one another. Sure, we all love one another. That's fine. Easy peasy. Jesus is saying, if, if people see how you love one another, that will show the world that you're my disciples, that what I've said to you, what I've given to you, the commands, the things that I've taught you about are real. They're not just a head knowledge or a religious observance. They're a, a way of life, something that you are living out. That is undeniable when people see you. But right at the end, he says this, if you love one another. Isn't that great? There's a command, love one another. And then at the end of it, it's like, if, if you do. So there's maybe a bit of a challenge there as well. Actually, there's lots of commands in the Bible. There's some famous ones like the Ten Commandments. 
See, when God gives commands, they're not this kind of heavy, you better do this or you're in trouble. God's commands actually bring life. They're life-giving, the life for you and for others. And so Jesus' command sounds pretty straightforward. Well, love one another. Cool. I'm into love. I'm a loving kind of guy. Easy peasy. But it also is clearly optional if you love one another. I'm not sure how well as the church over the many hundreds, thousands of years we've done at loving one another and loving the world. So um, we'll jump in and see what happens. Now, some of you may know I'm a, a pretty keen uh, enthusiast of the game of football. And occasionally I uh, play football. And as a kid growing up, I was very good at football. And I'd get the ball and I could do all the stuff. And the only problem was I had no one to play football with. So I just ran around in my garden on my own playing football. But because I have a creative imagination, I would imagine defenders and everything in front of me. I'd be doing the commentary. Oh, he takes it down the wing. Savage has got around him. He's going for the goal. The crowd would be going wild. It was just me just running around a garden on my own with a football. Yeah, it is a bit sad, I know. Um, the deal is football isn't really supposed to be played on your own. It's really a sort of team game. It really helps if you've got someone else to play football with you. And even better if you've got a team and another team. Now, there's something about when we look at community and doing life with Jesus, the first thing is we realize it's not a solo effort. It doesn't work just playing Christianity on your own in the back garden. Even though it might seem good in your head, it's never been set out like that. Jesus has always said this is for a people, a community to do together. And in fact, the history, the story in the Bible is of God always speaking to a people, a group of people, to know him and be loved by him and to love him. And in doing so, that group of people can actually show God's love into the world. In fact, it was called the, the nation of Israel. God's people were to be a light shining to all the other people in the world to show God's goodness and love. And that's never changed. So when Jesus comes along and speaks to these disciples around the meal, it's very simple. I'm not telling you, good luck, guys. You're on your own now, each to your own, and I hope you make it. Love one another. That's going to be the key. How do you do loving one another in community? And I wonder how much have we been distorted as church where we still think it's an individual thing. When we talk about prayer, I should pray more. When we talk about reading the Bible, I should read the Bible more on my own. I should give more on my own. We seem to just always reduce it down to me and God thing, where it's us and following Jesus. And so the first thing, it can never be a solo effort. It's a communal effort. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go somewhere fast, go on your own. And if you want to go somewhere slowly, then bring your kids. I'm not sure if I've got that quite right, but you know what I mean, be lucky to get out of the village if you have my kids, to be honest. It's never going to work. Just, you can zoom off on your own. But it's all been set up, designed to do it with others. And that may well be slow. In fact, I want to say right now, we're not in a hurry as a church. We have all these notices coming to us. Get busy. The Alpha course is coming. We've got to meet all the students. The burgers need cooking. We've got stuff to do. Get busy. And yet we're not in a hurry. We're not rushing to get anywhere. But how do we do our life together? What is the quality, the hallmark of it? And how do we guard and pursue that together? So the, the New Testament, which has the writings of Jesus, talks about this thing called the church. That's where it started. And the word for it is ecclesia in the Greek. That means really, well, a gathering of people. It doesn't mean a building. It doesn't mean screens or microphones or fancy things. It just means people. The church really is just a community. And it always will just be the people that it's called to. In fairness, a very random group of people. I mean, just look at you. No offense. Do take a little look. A very random and eclectic group of people. Lovely though you all are. Um, there's, there's something a bit interesting. That when Jesus calls people, he doesn't seem to pick the, the, the best ones. So the, these disciples, these followers. <laughs> all right, stay with me here, guys. I didn't mean it like that. Jesus, well, actually, he wants everyone, but he'll take anyone. There's people here who are rich and successful. There's people here who are poor and have failed. There's people who know what they're doing and what they're about. There's people who don't have a clue. 
There's people who've grown up in privilege and had great opportunity. There's people who've grown up in the most horrendous of circumstance. You see, the church isn't a club where you just pay your membership fee and come along. The church is a, a community of people that actually is centered on Jesus. And Jesus says yes to everyone, but not everyone says yes to Jesus. And so the invitation is always there. There's always a space and there's always a place for people to come. And so even as we look at the life of Jesus, one of the key questions was, well, who is this guy? Well, who do you say I am? Would be Jesus' reply. And some would want to follow him and say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that God has sent you, that you are God himself walking the earth. And others, I'm not so sure. We've seen people like this before. But the invitation is always there. And so as a community, one of the hallmarks we have to push into is how we welcome people. It's so great to hear the work of BISC and the student stuff, but we need to be a radically welcoming community. And the reason is simple, because Jesus' vision isn't just to have this club or a community group that sounds nice. He's actually going for this radical alternative society. A brand new venture of people who orientate around the life of Jesus. And as we would say, his kingdom. That means his ways. Jesus is the king. We want to follow him as our first and foremost thing. So actually, it's our hard to be able to welcome. And yeah, there's going to be lots of people coming to Bristol, lots of opportunities to welcome people. But we want to be radical around that because we believe that's what God's heart is for everyone. One of the ways that... Um, I would say that we can do welcoming is often we're encouraged, even on a service like this, to be friendly. Chat to your neighbor. Have you done that? I don't know. Some people like doing that and some people hate doing that. So I'm really sorry if that makes you feel awkward. Chat to someone next to you. Say hello. Be friendly. And yet I don't think the welcoming that is great, is, is an, that's enough. I think it's got to go somewhere else. It's got to say, how do you welcome people into your life? How do you welcome people into your home? How do you welcome people into your family? How do you welcome people into your story? How do you welcome people around for dinner? How do you welcome them as you just go for a trip to Ikea? Actually, we're, we're given an opportunity to invite and welcome people into our life. And as they do it, what do they see? How you love one another. And see something of the quality of God's love to us. And so... Um, it's really important, I think, that as we, in a season of welcoming, as a community that is centered on Jesus and wanting to offer that, that we, we have a vision of it. We're not just told we have to do it, but it's something that we believe and we see. So I don't know who you're having lunch with today, Nettie. I know you're having lunch with lots of people. But who are you sitting next to at lunch? It's lunchtime. These people are probably having a big influence on your life and who you are. Actually, it's simple to welcome people, but can we go beyond just being friendly in a church building? Say, how do we welcome people into our lives and into the life of God? So that's a thing for you. And I'd say there's always a place for people here at Woody's. You might say, well, there's not many chairs free, Nigel. You know? But the thing is, I think God's heart is always so big for us, for, for the people that don't yet belong. You think, well, we'll need more chairs, we'll, we'll run out of room, we'll have to have more coffee, we'll need more services, we'll have to do more groups, we'll have to do loads of stuff. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Absolutely, we will. As we want to say, yeah, every person is valued and important. Every person has a place. I think that's so key for us as we see is how big is our vision for it. We as a church community are in a, a kind of season of grief as we've sadly lost someone very unexpectedly and tragically called Michelle Russell. And she was a, a young adult here, wonderfully full of life and living life full for Jesus. And, and we have a Michelle Russell hole in our community that can't be filled, can't be replaced. It's there, we're feeling it and we're grieving it. I think we should never think that we, we don't matter or that we're insignificant being part of church. Everyone has their place that's unique for them. And it's not just the church, it's in God's heart for having a place for every person. And so I really believe that as we welcome people and we want to be radical in our welcoming and invitation to be part and belong, is that there's a place for everyone and no one should feel overlooked. So um, that's one of the things we want to talk about and think of as we do community. So the witness of our community is, is based on the quality of our love for one another. Again, in that passage, it's clear Jesus draws the parallel by how you love one another is then how you'll be seen. How is that witness being? 
Uh, yesterday, there was a really big wedding here, and some of us are still feeling a bit tired from it this morning. And actually, over the summer, we've had loads and loads of weddings, and we love weddings here. And Dave, the senior pastor, has reflected that many people have spoken to him, people who've not had a background of being in church or anything like that, and said, ah, oh, this has just been, it's really touched me. And I've been to weddings before, but there's something going on here. What is it? And actually, I believe it's the presence of God. As we gather, God meets with us. But also, I believe it's that love one another. The quality of our love for one another as a community is a witness. And it's seen and it's noted and it's invitational. There's something attractive to it. And so that's a reflection. I believe that as we celebrate and we celebrate life together, that actually it is an attractive witness. And we're called to be that. Jesus uses that language when he talks to some of his disciples and crowds, saying about being salt and light. And we as a church want to be this. Salt is seen, no, light is seen and visible. And we want to be like that in the city. To proclaim, actually, you know what? God loves the city. God loves Bristol. God loves people. God's not given up. Actually, this is a place of hope. We believe in all that God's wanting to do for the good of everyone. But also we're called to be salt, dispersed, and just wherever we're going to be tomorrow. That's another way that our community can work, where we're just wanting to be a blessing, an influence for good, wherever we're placed. So this command to love one another, I believe it should kind of bind us, you know? It, it, it's more than just a good idea that we need to agree to, but there's almost a commitment towards one another that we need to show. Jesus loves um, in a radical way. And what I mean by that is, I suppose there's all sorts of different ways of loving, like I love West Bromwich Albion. They're an amazing football team, and they're the team I love. And I love them to bits. And if anyone ever asks me, do you support a football team? I say, I love West Bromwich Albion. Any Baggies fans in the room? Yeah, I didn't really expect. That's okay. You probably, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm secure around that stuff. I love West Brom. And see, the thing is, um, they're in the Championship League. I know that. In the top ten. I know none of the names of their players. And the one striker I did know they sold last season. I haven't actually been to a game for quite a few years and I've no idea who they're next playing. I'm that kind of fan, you know? I'm a big fan, I love West Bromwich Albion, but the reality is I don't give them any money, I don't go to any games, and I don't really know what they're up to. <laughs> but I'm a fan and I love them. And I think a lot of us can be like that with Jesus and the church. Oh, I'm a big fan, yeah, I love that stuff. I love what they're doing. Obviously I haven't been for a while, and. I don't really give them any money, and I'm not quite sure who the new people are. I've not really met anyone. But, you know, I love what they're doing. I love what's going on. I think the command to love one another that Jesus gives us is far deeper than being a fan to just come along and go. It binds us in a number of ways. Now, in the Bible, in the New Testament, there's lots of one another's. This, and I think it's used from this phrase that Jesus said, love one another. And so some of the other writings kind of unpack what those one another's are. And I'm going to read them out to you. So when we just talk about loving one another, do we like, hey, love you, man? Or, well, no, this is the love one another. This is the kind of where the loving hits the road. All right, here we go. You can love one another by honoring each other and accept one another. Bear with one another, bear with, bear with, and forgive one another. We're to pray for and confess sins to one another. We're to cheer on and challenge one another. We're to admonish and confront one another. We're to warn one another and teach one another. We're to stop gossiping or slandering one another. We're to stop being fake. We're to bear burdens with one another. We're to share possessions with one another. And we're to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. So there's some of the ways that this one another, to love one another, is worked out. That's quite some list. And I think as a, a community, one of the hallmarks, I suppose, of the quality of our love for one another is how well we do these one another's. And maybe some of them you're good at, and some of them you shy away from. Maybe it would be a good thing to have a look at for you this week. Have a look through some of those one another's. How am I doing with that? You see, the challenge is it's easy to love one another when it's all fine and going well. But how do we love one another enough to confront each other if things aren't right? How do we love one another enough to 
pursue relationship even when we've been hurt and we need to forgive each other. This is what Jesus is calling out. This is why there's a if you love one another. Because this stuff you really need Jesus' help with if you're going to keep loving out, living out the loving one another's. I wonder whether for some of us when we make decisions around our lives, where we're, jobs we're doing, careers where we're living, big decisions like that, or maybe even small ones and schools and things, do we reference how does that decision impact our community, our church community? How, how does that have an effect on my commitment and engagement with community? So I think there's a challenge, there's a binding, I believe, to one another. Is there a, a shared commitment? to one another as we, as we pursue this. But I think there's more. I think being in community is costly and sacrificial. And this is what I mean. Firstly, we're well, all here this morning. And there's a cost to doing that. You had to get up and be here. And because you're here, you're not at home relaxing. You're not having a nice breakfast or going for a walk. You've chosen to be here. There's a cost to it. Now, um, maybe if it's not costly or sacrificial to you being in church, maybe you're just consuming and not paying the bill. But I believe in the, in the hallmark of, again, our, our life together, there is a cost and a sacrifice being called out of us. I don't know, for many people um, in our church, we have lots of groups that meet midweek. And what happens is we get together and we share together and we catch up with each other and read the Bible and pray. Now, I've been in groups like this for years and years. And have you ever had this experience? You've had a really busy day, get to the evening, your dinner's late, it's rushed, and then you realize it's home group that night. And even worse, not only do you not feel like going to home group, but you've said yes to doing a bit of it, praying for the nation's bit. And you're like, oh no, I can't even get out of it because I've got to do a bit of it, so now I've got to go to home group. Have you ever felt like that? I'm sure you haven't, that's only me, on many times. And then you're like, okay, and you go along to home group, you drag yourself there and you put on your Christian face. Hey, guys, great to see you. Hey, I'm a professional, right? I've got that stuff down. So you do it and you turn up. And then by the end of the evening, as you go home, and you're like, actually, that wasn't too bad. That was actually all right. In fact, it was really sweet how thing he shared about that answer to prayer because we've been praying for them as a group for a little while. I've forgotten completely all about it. And then, actually, it was great to hear that answer to prayer. And Jim prayed out loud for the first time for someone. It was a really short prayer and he got the name wrong, but... Actually, it was, that was just so cool. He took a bit of a step there. And actually, I prayed for the nations. I don't know if anything changed. But I think there has to be a cost in what we do in church. I think there's a costliness and a sacrifice. And one of the things we called out is um, in Romans 12, there's a really famous bit in the Bible that talks about worship. And I'm going to read it to you now. But often, we, again, we hear it. It just means me. I've got to worship God in this way. As I believe that the hallmark of how we pursue community that's pleasing to God, to one another, this love one another's, is actually lived out communally. Listen to this. This is in Romans 12. It says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, together holy and pleasing to God. This is our true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Then we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. One of the ways that we worship God is by giving a sacrifice, and that's with our time and our money and our lives. And so when you go to a home group on a, a rainy, wet Tuesday evening that you don't want to be at, there's a cost, but there's a blessing there because it's costly. I think there's a, a, a hallmark of community that we need to hear and, and pursue and have a vision for around why we could commit to what we do. So where does this leave us? Well, we're all going to zoom off and get busy and do lots of things. But for us as a, a community and a church community that's centered on Jesus, we want to hear those words that he says to us to love one another. And we want to be able to live that out in a way that not only honors one another and all that Jesus is asking for us, but also is a way that is a witness to the world. And that when people come and see in a part of it, they themselves may know the kind of purposes and the love of God. So I'd love you to stand with me. And I'm just going to pray for you and pray for us as a community and all the challenges that there are. Do stand up, yeah. 
Um, there's a real challenge. I've not talked about all the practical stuff of how to join groups and how to be community. I'm going to let you figure that out. But I want you to know that there's this, it's just so important for us that our community is deep and authentic and real. Rachel, I'll get you to come up as well. But I'm just going to pray for us now. Yeah, Jesus, thank you for the church. Thank you, that's your idea. And even though it's sometimes not easy, Lord, we, we know that we need your help to be in community. Thank you, community is for our blessing. And so this is what Jesus, he says to us today. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Lord Jesus, help us to hear that call to love one another. Lord, would you, I want to pray for a kind of a fresh sort of energizing of that to pursue loving one another, <laughs> to pursue going there with each other, to pursue a, a radical welcome, a, a costly commitment to each other, to community, in order to welcome people in, but also to ask for God's favor and blessing on our life together. And Lord, maybe where we've been fragmented, maybe where we've not pursued that enough, would you forgive us? And Lord, would you renew us again in our love for you and pursuit of you? And so I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.